Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at regenerative agriculture, climate change, and many other issues that impact our lives. My guest is an expert on these topics. Forrest Lighthouse is the Chief Enabling Officer or CEO of Planetary Care. He is a business architect, scholar, research, researcher, synergist, and strategist. Forrest Lighthouse, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Uh, very nice to be with you, Bill. I appreciate you being with me. You, you've got quite a resume. Right? We, we could focus on any one particular point and stay with it for about uh, 20 minutes at least. But let's start off with planetary care. What is a planetary care? When was it formed? Why was it formed? What, what is its main function? Sure. Planetary care is um, aspiring and developing to be a global uh, collaborative commons. Uh, it basically was formed in 2018 as a legal blend between a nonprofit organization. We have a 501c3 primary purpose and a special type of low profit um, for profit organization that is structured as a multi stakeholder collaborative. That way that basically the assets that we're building, which is a combination of human assets, many of the breakthrough technologies that have been learned in the last several years of how you build thriving human communities um, are really unknown to most people. And then on the other side, we have all these breakthroughs happening in the digital world. And these digital breakthroughs really lower costs and increased effectiveness. And for regenerative ag, our primary purpose is building global resilience through regenerative agriculture. And um, so this is really what we're all about. Mm -hmm. And our viewers can go to your website at www.planetarycare.org uh, for more information. You were talking about, and I mentioned in the opening, regenerative agriculture. What exactly does that mean? How, how would you define that? Uh, you know, it's interesting, um, the Rodale Institute came out with that name probably about 40 years ago. And basically regenerative agriculture is paying attention to three core areas. One is soil health, um, you know, conventional agriculture basically treats uh, soil as dirt as an inner medium to hold chemicals. Whereas soil health really recognizes that the soil when healthy is a thriving uh, soil food web of life. Uh, the second is biodiversity. And as many people may have heard, um, our propagators and bees and many other areas, these are all impacted directly by biodiversity and play a huge role in uh, agriculture. Uh, and then the third area is watersheds. And so the three of these together is really regenerative agriculture how you build those to a thriving um, uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you were talking about multi-stakeholders. Uh, how, how do you define that? Who are some of the stakeholders or what are they? Are they, are we talking about the issues? Or are we talking about entities getting involved in this? Yeah, we're a B2B organization. So business to business as an enabling backbone type organization, we help our members, and these are the stakeholders I'm mentioning. So in order to basically improve and expand regenerative agriculture globally, we really need to be working with and allowing collaboration between all of the major players in the value chain or the supply chain. So we've identified six major stakeholder groups. That's of course the farmer, and then the supplier to the farmer of regenerative ag types of products and know-how and so on. But of course, also the wholesale buyers, which are specifically looking, there's great demand for regenerative agriculture raised products. Uh, the next is investors. There's a lot of investors that are looking for these kinds of organizations. Researchers are wanting to publish information around them and have largely had challenges doing that. And then there's independent uh, advocate organizations. <clears throat> and they also are really committed to raising the public awareness about how important soil is to, uh, in fact, the existence of man and the impact on climate change. 
you mentioned climate change and you're well you're living in portland oregon as i understand it and we've seen this horrific heat dome that was over the northwest this ties right into climate change uh, according to the specialists the scientists they're saying we're going to see more and more of these heat domes we're going to see that climate change is wreaking havoc creating torrential downpours in one area and, and droughts in the other we're experiencing that with the lower part of the United States, uh, the southwestern part. Uh, several states are in a drought. They've been in a drought for years. How, how do you factor that in to your planning and what's going on in your particular area of the world, but also to the world as a, as a whole? Sure. Um, well, thank you. And you're exactly right. I, I mean, the drought, um, they're calling it a, a thousand year drought that's hit the western United States right now. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's been interesting is, uh, is basically how the impact of conventional agriculture has largely been outside of the discussion of what's causing climate change, when in fact the way that conventional agriculture works causes a tremendous amount of carbon to be released out of the soil into the atmosphere. Regenerative agriculture does exactly the opposite it actually turns around and sequesters carbon right into the soil. But in, while it's doing that, it's providing a whole series of what's called ecosystem services, having to do with drought and flood. And one of those key ecosystem services that happens as a result of all the fungi that's growing and the porosity and the health that happens within the soil is it increases the water holding capacity dramatically. And as a result of that increased water holding capacity, crops survive a lot better and much fewer losses in periods of low water and also are able to absorb much more water without damage um, in periods of flood or high water. So in all cases, it's basically making the soil and therefore our food supply much more resilient. So one of the key ways to combat climate change would be through this carbon farming, is that correct? As opposed to far, carbon emissions, that type of approach? Yeah, that, that's uh, actually one term that's been applied to it to try to really bring forward the idea and the recognition that the soil um, really can be a major um, mitigator of climate change. Um, that actually, um, um, about um, in 2017, I was part of the launch team uh, that after 18 months launched the Carbon Farming Innovation Network. Uh, and that is a group of uh, invitation only uh, about 65 um, people that are from all over the planet that represent all those stakeholder groups that I just mentioned that have come together under the um, organization of Green America. And we currently meet twice a year in person to turn around and identify initiatives and move initiatives forward, which we do in between the times we meet in person. And the Soil Carbon Initiative, which is a fair, um, um, well-validated mechanism that farmers can ascribe to that say, I have the intention and these are the things I'm doing to increase soil health and be able to get recognition for that. You mentioned you meet in person. That's that caught my attention. Did you meet in early 2020, or uh, people are back? A actually, a now. yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, 2020 and 2021 so far had to change our plans, and we met uh, virtually, uh, which enabled actually the organization Green America chose to open it up much wider. Though we're certainly all looking forward to figuring out what it's going to look like in post-COVID. Um, whether we end up in some blended model, we all recognize meeting in person has tremendous value, um, as well as the expanded um, group when we can meet virtually. Mm -hmm. you're, you're an expert in this area. We've been talking about soil, regenerative farming, that type of thing. Do you, do you feel that people are getting more concerned about this now, as opposed, I think many years ago, people just had the attitude, well, if you have a John Deere tractor, you have a farm, you plow, you plant, you harvest, you know, that's the end of the cycle, that type of thing. Do you think people are really trying to learn more about it and the key role that soil and farming play into 
dealing with climate change and many other problems too, not just climate change, but to make sure we have the capabilities of providing food for future generations? Uh, it absolutely is growing and you can see it by some of the feature films that have come out recently. For instance, I'll um, mention Kiss the Ground, which is both a book and a really good documentary that's talking about this. They, for the last several years, have been actually now have over, I think, 5,000 people that have come in to be trained as soil advocates and basically speaking in their local community to awaken people. You know, I mean, our, our nutrition in our food has dropped between 40 to 70 percent uh, in the last 30 years. And this is directly related to the lack of the health in the soil. And so nutrient density, flavor, um, a tremendous amount of health impacts are directly connected to the toxins like glyphosate, which is now, which is Roundup, which is now actually prevalent in virtually everything that we eat that's commercial. That is frightening. That is frightening. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a website or a podcast and you like our shows and you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at an issue that affects everybody on planet Earth, all nearly 8 billion people, and that is climate change. And of course, we're looking at the critical role of agriculture in dealing with this problem. I guess today is an expert on this topic. Mr. Forrest Lighthouse is the Chief Enabling Officer or CEO of Planetary Care. Forrest, we were talking about climate change and of course, the, uh, the, uh, the United Nations has been in the forefront of really developing key international conferences, studies, research studies, what have you, on the ills of climate change and climate crisis, I should say now we've reached that point. This is such an important topic, but the UN also has focused on other groups too, especially through the sustainable development goals to empower women and children, to eradicate hunger, to eradicate poverty, to combat climate change, to promote clean oceans, clean water, sustainable water, and those types of things. How, we'll just take two of them. Let's just take climate change and women and children, or women and young girls. How do those two factor into what you're doing as far as the importance of how we have to move more quickly, uh, more rapidly than we are right now to help us achieve some, some level of normalcy and security? Sure, thank you for that. And, um, you know, I mean, one of the things that's really important to realize is currently across the planet, um, we probably have under 2% of agriculture that is being farmed regenerative agriculture methodologies. So there's really a massive amount of distance to go. At the same token, we have about 70% of the planet that uh, the food supply comes from small farm holders. So basically the costs and the ease of being able to use these regenerative practices needs to be um, effective for them as well as institutional and industrial farming. And so basically what we find is organic food directly impacts women. It impacts, uh, of course, the food supply. It has a direct impact on the waterways in which that are associated with those farms and everything from the lack of chemicals going into it. And it's really the chemicals in the waterways that create such things as toxic lakes and dead sea zones, which is an ocean zones, which have been continuing to build. So um, there's a research that was done by the Asian Development Bank um, just a few years ago that was basically able to link all 17 of the SDG goals um, mostly directly, some indirectly, 
to organic farming and the benefits that organic farming brings to the planet. That is so absolutely critical. It, uh, it certainly is. And of course, we see the role, uh, well, just in agriculture that women play in particular in developing countries, they do 75% of the work, but even in the economically developed countries, women are a critical factor in not only the production, in agricultural production and in other businesses too, but as far as the financial aspects, are they not? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, this is really bringing to the whole area of inclusion and diversity and such. And certainly women is a very major factor. But one of the things also with regenerative agriculture is understanding that many of the indigenous practices, some of which may be known now as agroforestry or even permaculture, which is which is really looking at how do you do poly systems that are really resilient in the face of changing climate over time. And so we have a lot to learn and uh, planetary care is deeply committed to inclusion and diversity and sees the tremendous value that happens as a result. Mm -hmm. There is a lot to be learned from indigenous peoples in the area of agriculture. As I recall, they were talking about uh, folks, in, well, I'll just take uh, in the Andes and in Bolivia and uh, oh, in Colombia, Peru, different countries like that. Now, years ago, they were doing terracing to prevent erosion, runoff, uh, to capture the water, to make sure that their, their plants were not washed away. But if you look at the, even the base, well, let's go to the Amazon. We see that the, many of the indigenous peoples have used medicines for, for eons. I mean, you come right down to it. There are no doctors or hospitals at the headwaters of the, of the Amazon River. So they really have a lot to contribute to this, do they not? Oh, absolutely. And uh, even uh, closer to home right now, we're working on a program with the Climate Foundation here in the Pacific Northwest in the region known as Cascadia, which is on the Western side of the Cascades. And then also in the Great um, Basin Desert, which is on the Eastern side of the Cascades. And basically what we uh, are end up being able to do is work with the local organizations, including the indigenous that have been here for quite some time and bringing in agroforestry practices. Again, since we're dealing with uh, something that is so small relative to the entire agriculture, it's highly fragmented. So this is where planetary care comes in by having these relationships all over the planet knowing what the best practices are that have really worked well in other areas. And in this case, in the winter wheats in the Great um, um, Basin Desert, we're bringing practices that are coming from Australia that have been well proven out over there in, um, with similar types of climates and things. Um, things that uh, have to do with intensive um, um, ranching where you're moving the cows from one area to the next in um, doing them um, very tightly. So it really mimics nature. And that's very much a lot about what this is about is mimicking nature or bi um, biomimicry. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you talk about moving the cows, that reminds me of Switzerland where they take the cows up into the, into the mountains in the summer and down to the lowlands in the winter. So there's a lot of these people have been dealing with this problem for centuries, not, not just the last 5, 10, 15 years. Well, let me ask you, this is a complex issue. I understand that. And we really have a, a series of approaches to come at it. But if there are three things that you could recommend today that we look at to help us deal with this climate change crisis better, to try to avoid these massive heat domes, which I'm not sure we can do it. We certainly can't do it right now. We're not very effective. But what are two or three things you would recommend that we move on as fast as possible? Well, certainly um, recognizing the importance of soil health and why it's just critical. And in fact, the recognition that the loss of topsoils have been the collapse of multiple civilizations historically. So being knowledgeable about that, because then you can turn around and let your Congress people know and other people kind of know that this is important to you. We actually really need to change up the farm bill and who's being subsidized and all that type of thing. Additionally, in terms of let the um, buyers at your grocery stores know that uh, you're interested in regenerative food. 
and food that are raised with regenerative practices. You recognize it'll have higher nutrient density, but it'll also taste better and last longer. All of those are consistent features uh, that are there. And uh, get involved, Re recognize that indeed we are at a transition moment where there's going to be a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity that has to do with building the new green uh, regenerative um, practices and it needs a lot of um, uh, support um, and to be able to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And right before we started the show, we're talking about rebuilding or redeveloping, creating that type of thing, you mentioned that there is a whole new way of communication coming that we need to be aware of that I had not heard of, which is no great shock, but <laughs> what is spatial web? How, what exactly, how do you define that in the last couple of minutes that we have? What is that? doing and what will it do? And then the really quick thing is, um, you know, there was a time you may remember where the internet was uh, only text and AOL was sending out trying to get everybody on email for the first time. Then a man, Tim Berners-Lee, put out hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, and he put it into an open thing. And the entire World Wide Web that we have today is built on that protocol. Well, a new protocol has been approved by the IEEE, which is the global standards body for such things. And it's called Hyperspace Transaction Protocol. And it really recognizes that only now do we have sufficient bandwidth, sufficient computer capacities and everything, and the need because we are digitizing everything. And so what's going to happen with this and with this protocol is it's agnostic to any kind of blockchain or DLT. So you can use any kind you want. You can use any kind of sensor that you want to put the data in there. You can use any kind of artificial intelligence that you want, which is also coming in very quickly. So what's about to happen over the next 30 years, and we're closely tied into the people that are involved with this, is we are basically going to digitize the entire planet. And then we're going to enable it so that we can get a lot more intelligence and a lot more access as it relates to regenerative agriculture, for instance. We have lots of studies and lots of data up there that validates all types of practices. However, it's not interoperable. There's no way that you can really synthesize that knowledge and communicate it to others. The spatial web HSTP solves that among many other issues. There's a wonderful book called The Spatial Web by Dan Mapes that really gives anybody interested uh, deep information about this. Well, I'm sure that many of our viewers will go to this book and learn much more about it. And the people who are very knowledgeable in this area want to be even more knowledgeable, I'm sure. But this has been a fascinating topic. And uh, let me ask you in the last 30 seconds, how concerned are you when we look at areas like the Amazon Basin uh, river basin and how the Amazon jungle is being deforested, uh, trees are being chopped down, farmers are growing not very successfully crops for a year, two or three until the soils become leached. Then so often they try to put animals on there or they're trying to grow food for animals. Uh, how, how concerned should we be about this? I'm really quite concerned. I mean, uh, you know, they, uh, we've got two problems going on. We've got our, our existing methods of doing business that's really focused around just money and, and, and that's our sole measure of success. And they're creating a lot of what we call dumpster fires that have to be stopped and have to be put out. At the same token, the damage, so much damage is done We've got to be looking forward and investing a lot of time and energy in regeneration. And re sustainability is no longer even possible without the regeneration now. And so those are the really two areas that we're paying a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. Well, Forrest Lighthouse, this has been an enlightening overview of why we need to pay attention to agricultural practices, to the soil, and not take our food for granted, not take anything really in our society today, you come right down to it because these, these entities don't operate in isolation. They're not in silos, they're cross-cutting and they do impact people and they're going to impact people even more in the future. But again, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Oh, thank you, Bill. My pleasure.
I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.